Welcome to ANN In Depth. I am your host today, Ruben, and I'm excited for today's topic where we're going to be discussing leadership and specifically how we can encourage our leaders in our church. And I am joined today by two great guests where we're going to be discussing this in depth. Uh, first, I'm joined by Pastor Ivan Williams, who is the NAD Ministerial Association Director, and Pastor Benjamin Lundquist, a pastor in Oregon uh, and passionate about leadership and leadership development specifically. I I'm thankful for both of you for joining me today. Hey, Ruben, thank you for having us on uh, ANN. Ben, good to see you, man. <laughs> yeah, great to see you, Ivan. And uh, it, it's an honor. Um, I, yeah, I think uh, God's going to lead us to a great conversation. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. Well, uh, to start off, I'm going to just go out and say leadership is one of the passions that I have specifically developing other leaders, developing myself. And as someone who grew up in the church, you know, this is something that I have seen. I have seen some good leaders. I have some, some leaders that, in my opinion, said, man, they may need some support or growth. Um, so I'm going to start with you, uh, Ivan. How, as a church, um, even a, an administration position or just a church in general, can we support our pastors? How can we go about doing that? Uh, by providing resources for them, by encouraging them, and um, making them multipliers, mm. um, encouraging them to be coaches and mentors themselves. Mm. Uh, I think that's the whole discipleship process of passing it on. Mm. Leaders who keep leadership to themselves, for themselves, and by themselves mm. hinder the process of mission. Mm. Now, that's interesting because I, I, you do feel like sometimes when you're in a position of leadership, you have to do it all. Uh, you know, Ben, going on that note, what else can we talk about when it comes to the leadership specifically in the church? Yeah, you know, I think I think there are really two uh, focus areas as we think about moving forward. And, and we were even dialoguing, um, you know, Ivan and I before we went live about the reality of there just being a leadership crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that I think that's in our in our communities, uh, in churches. And so when I think about supporting and encouraging leaders, I think there is a call for us to raise up better leaders mm -hmm. and really looking at the empowerment of the younger generation. And I, I'm just going to say this, there has never and will never be a better leader than Jesus. And so when you look at the the way that Jesus developed leaders, I am, I could talk about that all day and maybe we'll jump into exactly what that looked like. But I think there's a need for us to, as a church, say we have to raise up better leaders. And then as Ivan mentioned, for those pastors who are in the field, we've got to create a, I think, cycles and rhythms of leadership development where we are offering resources and training opportunities to the leaders that we have in the field. And I look at leadership and discipleship um, similar in that you don't ever reach a plateau in following Jesus. You're always looking for that next level relationally. Um, how do I grow more intimately connected to Jesus? And I think leadership is the same way. You don't ever reach a leadership plateau. You're always looking for ways to grow. And so whether you're a leader who is in, the, in, in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, or even 80s, I think just like discipleship, there is always that next level mm. of leadership effectiveness that you can have. And, and I'll just say this because I've experienced this in my life. The way you led in your past assignment, you're going to have to lead a little bit differently in your current assignment because the landscape and the culture has changed. Mm. And so I think it's, yeah. it's just a, a call for us as a church to say twofold. We have to um, empower and raise up better leaders earlier. And then for those who we have pastors that we have out in the field, we want to create those rhythms of leadership development where we have, we cast a vision for a pastor to say, don't ever stop growing as a leader ever. Mm. Always be leaning into, and I, I think Ivan, you hit it so well. The, the most effective leaders are developers of leaders. That's the goal yeah. of leadership. Like your goal is not about having a title or a position it's about how do you as a leader grow and develop and multiply other leaders. 
you know, I want I, sorry, Ivan, I didn't mean to cut you off. Mm-hmm. I, I wanted to discuss that because I think you may be going on that is the multiplying of leaders. Yeah. Uh, you know, as as someone who's in a leadership position or if, if I've had discussion with some peasants, they feel like, well, I don't even know if I can develop others. I don't know if I've reached a certain level to do that. Uh, how do we address that? There's a book called Watch Them Grow mm-hmm. or Watch Them Go. Uh, the premise of the book written by two ladies um, The premise of the book is everybody wants to grow. And if they're not growing under your leadership, guess what? Mm. They're going to go. I I like what you said, Ben, uh, regarding plateauing. I think that if we do get to the point of plateauing, quite honestly, that's stopping to grow. Stop. That means you're not growing anymore. And, And we've heard this term being a lifelong student. I think the best leaders are lifelong students. They continue to listen to others. They don't surround themselves with groupthink. And they want people who are different than them. To be a multiplier means that you want people who will stretch you, grow you, and you can do the same for them. I think Solomon calls it iron sharpening iron. Mm Yeah, I, I love I love that, um, Ivan. And I think that's the I think that's the vision for every pastor who is a leader. And I'll just say that if you're a pastor watching watching this broadcast, if nobody has ever told you that before, you are a leader called by God to grow and develop other leaders. And I think that's such a good vision for every pastor to be a lifelong learner. And I love the quote that says, leaders are learners. And if a leader stops learning, he or she will stop leading effectively. And and I think it, it goes to that idea of multiplication. We can't take anybody where we are not ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so if we are wanting our churches to become centers of influence who develop disciples and develop leaders, we have to be, we have to have that vision for us personally, that we are always going to be growing and developing so we can challenge the people we work with to always be growing and developing. Mm. Yes. Yes. Wow. Why not be the best that we can be? Why not desire to leave the status quo? I mean, um, status quo really doesn't excite anybody. (laughs) No. Because you don't have to do a whole lot to be a status quo person. That's true. And um, for me, leadership is is huge. And and encouraging leaders in the journey, though they may have setbacks, um, I I have gone through some experience in pastoral ministry where I've I've made some mistakes. Mm. And what I've tried to do is not make the same mistake twice. (laughs) But I've surrounded myself with people who I can be accountable to in my journey of ministry. And that has helped me tremendously. People who are honest with me, who tell me the truth, and um, who walk with me through my mistakes. Hmm. Hmm. You know, hearing what you guys are saying, you know, again, leadership for me is something that's so important. And I had a con- I was having a conversation with a good friend of mine regarding leadership, and we kept coming to this point of self-awareness. And what I hear going on here a lot is um, good leadership starts with self-awareness. Is there something to be said about that? Specifically, um, what you mentioned, uh, Ben, about Jesus being the ultimate example we have as leadership. And I felt like there's something there to be said of the example we can get from Jesus. Yeah, you know, I th- you know, where, where for me, when it comes to where leadership starts, um, leadership for me starts in the individual taking full ownership of their life and their leadership journey. And, you know, it's it's not casting blame on the Adventist church. It's not casting blame on an organization. It's not making excuses, but it's saying the only one who can really lead you is you and being willing to take that ownership of your own life um, and making sure that your cup is staying filled up. So you have an overflow to give the people around you. And you, you are so right, Ruben, you know, 
being an effective leader means you have to be a self-aware leader. And I, I even had mentioned surrounding yourself with mm -hmm. people who can see the things that you don't see, who can call out the the uh, risk areas that you may not be able to see because you are too close to what's happening. And so I, I've heard somebody say that you are the average of the five people you surround yourself with. Mm -hmm. And so for anybody who is a, a pastor out in the field, who do you have around you and who are you surrounding your yourself with just knowing that that inner circle, um, they're going to be the ones that help you to be self-aware and challenge you to that next level and help you to grow. So absolutely that idea of, of being a leader who is self-aware. And for me, I think it just, it start it goes back to ownership. Like you have to take responsibility for yeah. your journey and for your growth. And when you do that, you stop casting blame on other people and you stop making excuses and you really look for those opportunities that you can grow. And Ivan, I would love to have you weigh in on this as well. Nobody is born a great leader. Nobody okay. is. And I, I know thinking back on uh, my time in undergrad and even being at the seminary, I wished that we would have had more conversations about leadership. Um, yeah. We didn't have a lot of conversations. And I know when I got out in the field, I was kind of bumping around trying to figure this thing out. But I think nobody's born a great leader. I think God puts the potential in all of us. But you have to excavate that potential and and grow and, and become, you know, who God has called you to be. Yeah, yeah. Ben, I love that. I, I, I tell you, um, not only are leaders not born in a fixed way, but leaders also have to, as you said, Ben, uh, be honest with themselves. One of the functions, I believe, of Christianity is to help us stop going through life telling lies to ourselves about ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I think Christianity confronts Ivan. And what am I going to do with that confrontation? Uh, God has called this earthen, flawed vessel. And, and, and yet, I believe, Philippians 1, 6, the work he starts in me, he's going to complete until the day of Jesus Christ. And yet, in that journey of his completion, there is a growth process for me. Yeah. And if I'm honest with myself, um, I need to always continue uh, being passionate about growing. And I think one of the ways to grow, and I don't want to shift the subject, but I think we as leaders need to do a better job of listening. Hmm. Hmm. Listening. Hmm. I think that's I think that's really good. And Ivan, you uh, made me think about something when it comes to um, that growth and leadership. What one thing I see that so many, and I hope this opens up a little dialogue as well. But I see so many discouraged leaders in the Adventist Church, and the root of their discouragement is a misplaced identity hmm. that they are taking their identity from the organization they work for or from, for, from the results that happen at their church. And, you know, for me and Ivan, you know, I, you had mentioned having some ups and downs and, I, you know, I've had leadership failures. I've had meetings go hor horribly. I have actually planned meetings that I didn't even want to come to myself. And I was the one <laughs> planning the meeting. And so, but I think it can be so easy to get discouraged if we are misplacing our identity in the results of our leadership instead of saying, let me go back every day as a leader to who I am. I am a son of God. I am a daughter of God. And that is the core foundation of my identity. And just being able to go back to that identity every day. And I, you know, I think about the story of the prodigal son. Yeah. When the prodigal son was at home. He was a son. When the prodigal son was um, in the pig pen, um, wishing he was at home, he was still a son. And Ivan, you said something that I think is, mm. I hope everybody hears. 
we have to stop um, being sympathetic to lies that we are speaking over mm. our life as leaders. And when you think about that prodigal son, when he was in that moment of discouragement, mm. he said the word over his own life, I am not worthy to go home as a son. Mm. I need to go home as a servant. Wow. And I think, again, we've got to go back to that core identity that is unchangeable, that I'm always a son or I'm always a daughter and make sure that we are not speaking discouragement and lies over our own life and just recognize that our worth and value, it doesn't come to how, it doesn't come from how well that meeting goes or how many people are in the pews or how many people you connected with in the community. Our identity is received, it's not earned and it's not lost. And that's that's one thing for me. I wish somebody would have told would have told me in my early yeah. 20s, Benjamin, be confident in who you are as yeah. a son of God. No matter how everything goes around you, you can always be confident in that one thing that you're loved and you're valuable and you have worth because God gave that to you. Wow. I love that. Ruben, you're the host, but I I, I <laughs> no, please go ahead. Hey, I gotta keep going. I, we yeah. have uh, one of the greatest young adult specialist leaders in the North American division. So I got to put him on the spot here. <laughs> um, ben, one of the things that I have seen that hinders the transmission of next gen leadership, uh, and one of the things that hinders the multiplying or the discipleship process is including young people, but the place or space not being safe for them. Yeah. I'll give you an example. I, um, you know, early on in ministry started including young people. I said, no, they need to be on the board. They need to be on the finance committee, yada, yada, yada. Well, one particular church, I had a young person on the finance committee and many meetings were not pretty. Uh, this was a young adult, probably freshman, sophomore in college. And I ended up having to apologize mm. to her for the conduct and for the toxicity of fighting over finances in her presence. And so, so Ben, what would you say to me, to other pastors, to leaders, how do we create these safe places so that young people would want to be a part and serve? Yeah, that that's a good question. And um <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go to something I mentioned earlier about Jesus being the greatest developer of leaders in history. Um, and how do we know that? Because the, the the movement that Jesus started is still wrapping the globe um, mm -hmm. today as it was back in the day. So to answer your question, Ivan, I think uh, a couple of things I'll mention, but I think it comes down to we need to look at the model of how Jesus developed leaders, because I think we often we look at our initiatives as leadership development when in reality it's not developing leaders as much as giving mm. a young person a title and a mm. position but let's just think about this leadership is not about a title and a position you can have no title at all and you can be the most influential person in your church and we all know people who have the loudest most influential voice or maybe just the most influential voice but they may not have a title so when we think about how Jesus developed leaders. Um, when we think about the Great Commission, look at how Jesus developed leaders. Mm. He provided number one opportunity. So if we are going to develop young leaders, we have to give them opportunity to use the gifts and the abilities that God has given them. So look for opportunities that exist, but think bigger in creating opportunities. So Jesus gave opportunity and then secondly, he gave clarity, and you can see that in the Great Commission. Here is exactly what I want you to do. Go and make disciples. And Ivan, I think that is that is part of that missing link that we often don't do. When we look at young leaders, 
let's remember they are leaders. They're not leaders in the future. They're leaders today. And I think the, the young leaders that we work with, they can handle a lot more than we give them credit for. And I think we need to give them clarity on setting them up for success. And you mentioned that example about the finance experience for a young leader, but being able to say, I want to give you an opportunity to come sit um, in the room when we discuss the finances of the church, setting that young person up for with clarity means mm. uh, front loading. This could be toxic and, and people get very sensitive around financial conversations and people have a difference of opinions by being able to give a young person clarity and set them up for success by letting them know, don't bail on this. This is part of the working out of the church to improve and get better. And so I think often we we provide opportunity, but we don't set young people up for success by giving them clarity on what they can expect when they walk into that room. Here's how you make here's how you make the most of this boardroom conversation. Here's um, how you can invest in this conversation. So anyway, Jesus provided opportunity. He gave clarity. And then Ivan, this is the big one, I think, and Ruben, where so many people get hung up. Jesus said to his disciples, and this gets me so pumped. Jesus said to his disciples, he says, all authority that has been given to me, I now give to you. Leadership development requires us to extend real authority to young leaders, not token authority, mm. but real authority, Love it. Mode bearing authority to actually make decisions and to have a voice. And so Jesus provided opportunity. He gave clarity. He extended that authority. And then Jesus uh, reassured his disciples by saying, I am with you always. Even if you fail, I'm going to be there. Even if nobody responds to that sermon, I'm going to be there. Even if you're preaching and nobody shows up, even if you're in prison for what I have called you to do, I'm going to be there with you. And so I think looking at that model of Jesus, the opportunity and the clarity and the authority and the long-term commitment, I think we can just do a much better job supporting those young leaders as we um, try to help them pursue and feel that purpose that God has for their life. Wow. That was great. I love that, man. I, I just have a bone to pick with you. Where were you a few years ago <laughs> when I needed that help? <laughs> for real. Where <laughs> you know actually you brought up a great point, uh Ben, and that's just first of all with the clarity that you described that was was great and impactful just to me now. Um and, and that is like before we went on, I was I received a study by the Barna Group that 82% of young adults say society has a leadership problem. Yeah. And then it got me thinking of what you're talking about. Are there leaders that are now in positions, but did not receive what you just described? Mm -hmm. you know, why are we having this where there are young people who are seeing the leaders, let's say in the church or just in society in general and saying, I can't trust that. That's not what I want to be. Or there's just no leadership here. Was there a gap of that being missed or, or was just leadership training not a thing? And, and how can we correct that? Well, I'll answer it at least now from an administrative uh, standpoint, because uh, that's kind of where I'm serving right now. Um, for me, I think a part of it has to do with the leader's attitude about his or her role. Mm -hmm. Um I'm in an elected position. Uh, there is no super glue on my role. Neither should that role define me as a person. In other words, if I have to do another role, I shouldn't lose my religion at nominating committee time <laughs> because I'm no longer asked to serve in this role. Hmm. And I think that we need to do a better job of allowing people to know that leadership ebbs and flows, not based on a title, but one's influence mm -hmm. and one's ability to, um, 
as I say, I'm being redundant, but, but multiply. I have seen leaders who have been threatened by other leaders' giftedness, so much so that they don't want dissent around them. They don't want a difference of opinion. They don't want someone who can out pray them, out preach them, out think them, whatever. Really? <laughs> that makes me look good if I have people around me who are smarter than me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And and so why keep the gifts down when the church has been given all of these gifts that I don't have and someone else may have that all of these gifts together will keep out schism in the church and move us to be more like Jesus and get the mission done. Hmm. That's just a quick response to your, your question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, think, I think that's great, Ivan. Um, and when you, when you talk about, we could do a whole episode on, <laughs> on, on leadership jealousy. And, uh, and I, I mean, I think about Joseph and Dakota many colors, and I think about how it can be so easy with a misplaced identity or not having the understanding of the multiplication, like you've been talking about, Ivan. It can be so easy for us to always covet somebody else's coat of many colors mm -hmm. when we can look at the coat of many colors, but forget that we have all received a robe of white. Wow. Um, and, I, and I think just being able to go back to know your identity, know who you are, and know that positions and titles really are about responsibility and focus for influence, but your position and your title is not what makes you a leader. What makes you a leader is that you have influence. And what makes you a Christian leader is that you have an influence that you are stewarding for the honor and the glory of God. That's that's the difference between a secular leader and a spiritual leader. Oh, yeah. A secular mm -hmm. leader is usually about the glory of themselves or their organization, where a spiritual leader is about God's glory. And it's about you know recognizing the gifts that other people have. And Ivan, you are so right. When that little switch can change in somebody's head where they can say, I know who I am and it's not about me, yeah. but it's about stewarding the platform that God has given me for multiplication of leaders. So the work of God could expand and grow. And I just know for me, cause I I've been there too. When yeah. it has become all about me, I bottleneck growth and yeah. all of a sudden nothing can expand beyond Benjamin Ooh. because in my mind, I have made leadership that should be about other people and about God, I made it about myself. And it usually is a it usually is a season of just misplaced identity. Like I've got to go back and do a reset on who God has called me to be and not forget that. Um, and you and Ivan, you said something I think is so pivotal too. We may have we may have one overarching purpose that God gives our life, but we have so many assignments. That's and it. every That's assignment it. is going to look a little different. And no assignment is less important than another assignment. And I, I used to I used to think that, you know, you had one purpose and you just have this one life. But yeah. what I've come to understand is your one life may have 30 different assignments in that one life. And it's about stewarding the platform of that assignment well. And so if you're at NAD, then praise God. If you're yeah. doing a church plant, then praise God. If you're working yeah. at a university, then praise God, but be faithful and fruitful in the assignment hmm. that God has for you at this time. Awesome. Yeah. Pastor Ben and Ruben, hey, this is hot. This is Yes, good. it is. Yes, it is. I have a quick I have a quick question. Okay. Um, Ivan and, and, and Ben, you both were mentioning, you know, this pastor, an example of a pastor who, who stifles growth or who is almost has a jealousy type, if you will. And, and there might be someone who's watching this right now and says, that's my pastor. You're describing my pastor right now. Uh, but, you know, they don't have the courage to tell that pastor face to face. What can we tell this church member or maybe a board member? How do you support 
someone when you've identified that's kind of the struggle we're having at my church right now? The biblical model probably is Saul. I think I counted, uh, maybe don't quote me, but about 14 chapters where Saul chased David through the Bible <laughs> because he was jealous of, of, of David. But uh, can I say this on ANN, that positional authority is dead. Mm, mm, okay. Positional authority is dead. The authority that spiritual leaders have, i.e. first, comes from God, and then that is to be expanded through influence and collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just leave it right there and, and maybe pass the baton to Pastor Ben. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the first thing I'd say, um, Ruben, is that if if somebody knows a pastor who is discouraged, or if you're watching this and you are a pastor who is discouraged, I would just I would just say, know that you are not alone. Mm -hmm. And I have gone through seasons of deep discouragement in my life where I just second guess who I am, my abilities, all that kind of stuff. And I think if you are around a pastor. Ivan, you had mentioned the, the, the gift of having people see things in your life that you don't always see. I'll mm -hmm. just say this, encourage your pastors, speak life into your pastors. I, would ha I was having worship with my kids last night, laying on our bed, and we were talking about, you know, life and death is in the power of the tongue. Uh -huh. And we have so many pastors who all they hear is criticism that mm. they're not doing well and that they're not living up to the expectations of church members. And let's be honest, every church member has their own expectations yeah. of what's supposed to happen. Yeah. But I would encourage, if you're a church member, encourage your pastor, affirm him or her of some things that you are seeing that's positive. Remember, they're going to receive 10 times the criticism as they might for an affirming comment. Wow. So give them affirmation for the things that they are doing well. Show them the things that, that they may not be able to see, but you're able to see. And look for those little things that are really important. Hey, pastor, I want to just affirm the gift that you have to connect with young people in the lobby after your sermon. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. And you're always intentional about never walking by a young person without giving them a fist bump or a high, or a high, well, actually not during COVID. No, no high five right now. <laughs> but I think just, you know, recognize that you can see positive things that your pastor may not be able to see and come alongside them, not as a critic, but as an ally to make them better. And Ivan, you said it, it when you mentioned collaboration, we are stronger together. So if yeah. you want a stronger pastor, then surround your pastor and come alongside your pastor. But we are stronger together and make it a goal for you to make your pastor better by encouraging him or her and coming alongside them uh, with that support, and maybe even asking, coming up to a pastor and saying, I want you to thrive. We mm. want you to live in your full purpose and yeah. your full potential in this assignment that you have here at our church. How can I serve you so you can serve this church? What do you need? What can I do? I'm praying for you. You got my cell number. Let me know what you need. Wow. Ben, I want to I want to affirm that because every leader has a blind spot. Yeah. And if you have never spoken to me, you don't have a relationship with me. But the first time you speak to me, you only deal with my blind spot. Mm. Automatically that causes me to say, okay, is this person balanced in their view of what we're trying to do here? So I affirm what you say uh to congregational leaders, to those in the uh, church, uh, or and even to maybe a team of associate pastors or youth pastor, what have you. Um, 
ask what you can do to help out in an area of deficiency. So if I notice that uh, my pastor is always late or um, maybe a team member needs to, to prepare better for the meeting, um, put things in place that will support them to deal with their blind spot in a positive way. Wow. Um, simple, simple things. I think that that's really good, Ivan. Yeah. And I just to add to that, if we as church members are going to make a suggestion for change, we better be willing to commit to helping with that. With that yes. yeah. and I, you know, it's so easy to say, well, we need to change this. And, and my initial response is, are you going to help with that? And if yep. you are, let's talk about it, you know, yep. but I think it can be so easy to say, well, here's what we need to do. Well, if you're going to make that suggestion, are you willing to step in and let's work together to help him to help improve that uh, one of my friends Seth Yalorda I don't know Ivan if you know Seth he's a pastor out of California but he mentions that every time they do a and this goes back Ruben to self awareness but every mm. time they do an event at a church or or a church function they always debrief and when they debrief they always are looking for three wins three things that went really well with that event and then they always talk about two growth areas. What are two things that we can do better? So when it comes to you know working with teams or your pastors, don't just focus on the growth areas. Make sure you are recognizing some of those wins. And yeah. I think it always goes better when you can celebrate the wins, which really opens the heart up to be in tune with the growth areas and then you can grow and you can be you can become better we're not saying that any any leader is perfect no. but we are saying if god is working through a leader let us give glory to god by affirming what he is doing through that individual like recognizing those gifts and those passions and yeah. then let's not stop there let's get better and let's grow a little bit more wow that's really impactful and I, and, and i really appreciate what you say because I know human tendency is to focus on the negative or focus on the things that didn't pan out and try mm -hmm. to focus on that. And it's, it's like we have to be intentional on focusing on that positive and making that a mindset. We're going to focus on this positive. Um, you know, I really appreciate what you said, Ben, because I, I, a good friend of mine who's a pastor also took that approach where he would say someone would come to the board and say, we need to do this, Pastor, we need to do this. And he said, all right, I, I, I kind of nominate you to lead it out. What do you think? <laughs> and all of a sudden the conversation shifted, but it got everyone involved. Um, Ruben, let me add to that. Yeah. Uh, Joseph Kidder did, wrote a book called The Big Four. Mm -hmm. And that study basically only showed that not many, well, showed not many churches were growing in the North American division. The ones that were growing had a common thread throughout. And that common thread was the growing churches had the spirit of optimism. Mm. We can take our community for Christ. We can do this. And, and I think it's it goes back to Numbers 13. Uh, the 12 spies were sent over to spy out the land and um, they came back, you know, shared the report, and, and the Bible says only two of them had a positive report that we can do this. The other 10 says, hey, we look like grasshoppers <laughs> compared to them. Yeah. And of course, they didn't go over um, into the land that God had promised them at that time. And one of the things I think is huge in this leadership conversation, this spiritual leadership conversation, and that is how do we, do we exude optimism or do we exude a negative spirit? Um, do we affirm people? Do we encourage people with affirmation? Uh, do we tell them what we like or all, or are they only hearing from us when they've done something wrong? Mm. I, I, I think those are impeders of progress. 
in the leadership spectrum, in my opinion. Hmm. That's yeah, Ivan, that's that's huge. And it may be a challenge for all of us as leaders to take inventory of the conversations we're having and to really assess when I meet with that leader, I need to make sure that the affirming comments always outweigh the challenging ones and making sure that people, I, I feel like when you leave a conversation or maybe a team meeting, that people should leave with more hope than when they came. Yeah. I mean, if, if people are if people are going to a board meeting and they're leaving, they're leaving discouraged that, that you got to call a timeout and say, why is that happening? You know, is it my style? And, you know, Ruben, for me, it goes back a little bit to, and I don't want to beat that drum too hard, but the idea of ownership, that if you are not leading yourself well as a leader, you will not be a well of life for other people. And if you are drained and your cup is half full or empty, you are not going to have any life to give or to speak to other people. So it comes back to, are you leading yourself well? Um, are you leading your family well? Are you keeping your cup filled up? And then intentionally take an inventory of that mindset. Am I, am I, do I have a critical spirit? Am I optimistic? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the the approach that we have with criticism or optimism, it's very complicated. Like it comes yeah. back to our, our training in childhood, the trauma yeah. that we've gone through, the temperament that we may have. But yeah. here, here's the encouragement for everybody. When you look at um, like the, the area of neuroplasticity, it, it's proven by research that the brain can change doesn't matter what age a person is. So I think part of it, and Ruben, you brought it up, is just being self-aware of the tendencies that we have as leaders, and then ask yourself, are those tendencies life-giving to other people? Mm. If they're not, just, just calling them out for what they are and being intentional about, I'm going to lead myself well. I know the tendencies that I have to focus on this area. I know what I what I where I want to be and then just making some intentional small shifts to begin to speak more life into your teams and speak more life into your church um, and yeah. into the people around you. Yeah, that's great. That's wonderful. Now, let me let me pose this scenario here, you know, as someone who grew up in the church and a lot of the people viewing uh, probably have a similar experience. Um, it's almost as if when pastors or, or leaders, they almost had a cookie cutter approach. You know, they need to be this way. They need to be that way. And mm -hmm. then what you were describing is a development of a, of someone in this particular situation, a pastor basically happening in front of this congregation or people that expect something already from a pastor. Mm -hmm. So as someone who has been in the position of a pastor and, and leader who has gone through this development, as we've discussed ups and downs, there's almost a vulnerability that happens. So how do you allow yourself when you already know there might be some expectation and knowing this vulnerability may kind of diminish or be contrary to what people expect? So it's like you're developing and growing in front of these people. Do you understand? How, how do we go about that? Yeah, I, I think that's a great that's a that's a great question. And I think whenever a pastor enters a new assignment, there are some expectations that the local community may already have for that individual. What I have seen um, trump expectations is, is humility and a willingness to learn. Mm -hmm. So people can have expectations on, we really, we want you to um, accomplish these goals. And I, and I think I, I believe in goal setting, all that kind of stuff. But if, if somebody is willing to come in and say, I don't know it all, that mm -hmm. I'm willing to learn, I'm willing to be humble. I'm not going to just give you my trophy case. I'm also going to give you those moments where I messed up and I learned. I feel like a congregation will rally around a humble, authentic leader mm -hmm. who is willing to build, Ivan, because you love multiplication, who is willing to build mm -hmm. humble, authentic leaders who are always going to be going to be learners. And I, I think when a 
when a congregation views a pastor as a know-it-all, somebody who's reached the pinnacle, somebody who's at the plateau, they push against that. And one of my young, one of my young uh, adults told me this, and, and I learned a lot from young adults. You know, yeah. I, they do. You know, I call it reverse mentoring, but I, as a little a seasoned leader, I can learn a lot from an eighteen-year-old and a twenty or in a twenty-year-old. But uh, this this young adult told me, they said, in today's um, culture authenticity is currency. Wow. We are not looking for somebody who has it all figured out and somebody who's perfect. We are looking for somebody who's real. And that doesn't mean you emotionally vomit every challenge <laughs> you have in your life, like all over everybody, yeah. but it means that you are, um, you are sharing your journey with your congregation that you're learning too, and that you are growing too and that you're reading and you're going to conferences and you're building that inner circle around yourself. So, you know, expectations are always going to be there. And, but I, I think there is a rallying around a local leader when the congregation knows that he or she is, is humble mm -hmm. and they're committed to learning and they really want to grow together with their church. Ben, those are excellent, excellent points uh, for pastors and congregations. And I'll continue that theme by adding, um, as a conference ministerial director, I used to help churches understand that pastors need grace in growing. They're growing before you. Mm -hmm. um, but as pastors, we don't get to see members growing necessarily in their daily work, uh, day in and day out. But 52 times, at least, someone gets to see whether I'm growing or not in my leadership. And so I've encouraged, uh, you know, giving grace. Uh, Pastor Ben, you mentioned something about um, authenticity. Uh, I think another word to add to that is also transparency. Mm -hmm. And what does that look like? What I try to help um, younger pastors understand is that doesn't mean that, <laughs> I love your word, vomit. <laughs> that doesn't mean you take the church through every personal up and down in your journey as pastor. But what it does mean is that you share with them, maybe here's some areas of study, here's some things I'm interested in, here are some areas I know I need to grow in. But it doesn't mean that you have a personal counseling session every Sabbath in front of the church, because that's spiritual quackery. What are they going to do with it? If I share personal stuff all the time, what should the congregation do with that? And so that is not wise leadership. I think authenticity and transparency look like just making sure that you're communicating clearly, openly, and, um, and that you do give them insight into your own personal world, but it shouldn't be uh, a counseling session that you're asking for help every Sabbath. That, because, oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah, then it becomes about you and and you're not sharing to take the congregation somewhere. Uh, if I have a deficit that someone else may be able to learn from, that's one thing. But um, I think I have seen transparency in ways that have almost derailed the mm -hmm. pastor's yeah. uh, pastorate because maybe uh, not only a personal sin, but a, a, a family flaw, you know, bringing their marriage issues in the pulpit or talking about the challenges, you know, I don't know. But my point is that being a leader means authenticity, transparency that is responsible i'll put it that way that that's so good that's so good and um let me let me add to that and we keep adding <laughs> i love it i love it let's keep adding let me add to that i think you know 
part of the leadership, uh, part part of being an effective leader is um, being in, intentionally engaged in community. And I think we also don't talk about that enough. And it's in the in community where we can have that transparency and that authenticity. And I think for so many leaders and pastors, when I, if I were to ask somebody, do you have community? Their response would be, oh yeah, I've got friends. But mm -hmm. think about this. Jesus was extremely intentional about his multi-layers of community. Mm -hmm. So let, let me just uh, go through that real quick. It'll take two seconds. Jesus had the crowd community and that, you know, that that's where he was preaching the word and he was teaching the broad community. Mm -hmm. And that was the crowd. And then Jesus had the 12 disciples, which were his companions that he traveled through life with for three years. And then Jesus had the confidants, which were Peter, James, and John. And then he had the core which was his relationship with the father. So when it comes, I think, Ivan, to transparency and authenticity, you express that differently depending on what layer of community you are connecting with. And the reason why a pastor yeah. doesn't have to air out every struggle that he or she may be having is because they've got a Peter, James, and John. Uh, and they've got right. the accountability partner and they've got the relationship that they're having with the father on the daily. And so I think leading intentionally means fostering and growing multi layers of community within the life of a leader. And then you engage with those layers with transparency and authenticity in a way that is fruitful for that layer of community. I've got a friend, uh, a pastor out in, in California. We've been accountability partners for 17 years. Wow. I, can't, I can't even believe it. And we call or talk almost every Friday, and, mm -hmm. and there is no filter in our conversation. We talk about anything and everything, and that's a place where I can express that 100% transparency and accountability. And so I just think, you know, with pursuing that as a leader, just recognizing you have to intentionally grow multi layers of community like Jesus, and then you engage with different layers in a way that's going to be fruitful for you. That's wow. rich. That's rich, man. I love it. That, that was great. That was great. Listen, this conversation has been fantastic and we could probably go for a lot more hours. Um, you know, we're going to wind it down here, but I completely appreciate uh, everything that's been discussed um, with this leadership. And, and just now, uh, Pastor Ben, with the multi layers, I could go in depth with that. But I, just to wrap up, uh, I want to give each of you a couple seconds here, a minute or so to talk to our, our, our pastors, our leadership leaders in the church and our future leaders in, in, in membership, what kind of words of encouragement would you want to leave with them uh, for the future of, of our church and just uh, leadership in general? I'm going to, I'm going to let pastor Ivan have the final word because okay. he, okay. Hey, listen, his yeah. word trumps my word. So I'm gonna, <laughs> what, I would, what I would say is um, you are a leader. And if nobody has ever told you that, let me just be the first one to say it. You are a leader called by God to use your gifts and abilities. And leadership is extremely challenging. It's hard. And so I would just encourage you, hang in there. Don't give up. Take full ownership of your life, your leadership, and your growth. And whatever assignment you are in, um, do your best to be faithful to God and fruitful in the current assignment that God has for you. Great. Wow. Can I add to that? I don't know. I think you can. Yeah. <laughs> Online now in the virtual world, the zoom world, the social media world, there are these people called influencers and they're usually influencing by the way they live, the product they've come up with. Uh, they may be the product. What greater influencer can one be than to be called by God 
and to have the purpose in life for fulfilling his will in your life, man, that's a real influencer. I want to close by saying you are a leader, as Pastor Ben said, and God has called you to be a multiplier, an influencer for heaven. And I want you to be of good courage. God will empty heaven just for you, to help you, to walk with you, to care for you. Stay faithful and the Lord will bless you and you'll walk through those gates and he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen, amen. And let's just finish there again. I wanna thank both of you. Uh, for joining me today. This was a great discussion. And for those of you watching, uh, we thank you for being with us. Pass this along uh, to others so they can listen to this conversation as well. And again, Pastor Ivan, Pastor Ben, thank you so much for your time and look forward to continuing this conversation another time. Thank you all for watching. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.